I apologize, this video is a little bit tangential, but there's some points here that I think need to be communicated. Okay, so this is another one. So much to do, waiting for your ADHD paralysis to end. It's hyperfixation. Again, we have these terms. What is ADHD paralysis? Like, if someone thought of this term, thought of those two words, like thought of, I sure feel par- and she's using this term paralysis again, which is very insensitive to people that are actually paralyzed. I mean, I don't think she came up with it. I'm sure she just heard this term ADHD paralysis and adopted it and this term hyperfixation. And these words have meaning. Like every word that we use, the type of language that we use very much influences the way that we think about the world and the way that we think about our place in it. So can we think about this as, as I am paralyzed by my ADHD or I am immovable and uh, suspended and what I want to be doing because I have ADHD. No, you can work on what you want to work on. You just have to fo you have to force yourself to be focused for a little while and then the neurochemistry starts kicking in and starts letting you be in more of a flow state with this. And ADHD also does very well with flow states. Like when we're in cleaning mode, that is a flow state. The problem is the kind of flow states that we're basically trapped in now is these entertainment first, instant dopamine release, instant gratification uh, entertainment systems that we have and it's not just entertainment systems like video games or, or movies there's I mean, we have our phones on us and we have many different things that are that are tugging at us and tugging at our attention and we get into flow states with those very easily as well so when it comes to picking up a story about like it's i won't get into too much more detail on this but it's complicated for two reasons that i can see right now there's the neuroconservational combinatorial explosion conservation uh, prevention that the brain has to do where it tries to seek the path of least resistance and that involves reaching for available labels, like the subconscious mind will latch onto these labels once our ears are introduced to them, once we hear these terms, and we'll start identifying, or we'll start using those as linchpins and anchor points for our development and lack of development. And two, we have this psychosocial development that's also drawing us towards using these terms to fit in and to bolster, bolster our ego, which is rooted in our survival, and there's... I talk about this a lot in the book as well. There's a lot of evidence for our deep need to bolster our egos being rooted in a survival mechanism that keeps us included in the tribe. Anyways, lots of ways that we can use these labels. There's lots of ways that we can find ourselves subconsciously doing these things. So it takes more effort and more energy to question our life narrative, for one thing, and it also takes anti-ego or ego examination from the, the social pressures to not do that, at least, or only examine it to the the level that it brings us social approval so we'll do like we'll come up with little cool little catchphrases or we'll like copy other people when they do cool things but to, to be fully original and to come up with original ideas that that seems to be harder to do and so when we see when we see people doing things like that and we're like wow that dude's so so cocky or he's just they're just trying to fit in oh look at that we can instead of being judgmental we can see it from a relational perspective and see how they are doing this this uh, neurobiologically imperative emergent phenomenon of ego ego bolstering it's a malfunctioning processing system it just takes a little bit of work like it does take uncomfortable work and for people with ADHD or people that struggle more than others with attention it's probably a better way to say that will struggle with this like it may be harder for them to get in that flow state and get into a, a focused state but when you're very much hyper stressed and you're in, in a sleep lacking state or you're lacking in a diet or other things like that that's going to contribute to that and it's going to contribute to certain debilitating states more than others and one of those debilitating states is ADHD so when you get back into a healthy state, a lot of times you see symptoms reduced. So hyperfixation, the, this is setting up the, those as paradigms, this is setting up those as the daily concepts that we have to deal with. And basically, these are the terms that we default to using to explain situational first-hand experiences. Right, let, me, let me read from some of my book to kind of elaborate on this a bit here. So acquiring disordered labels can make the person default to using them to explain misdeeds or errors in speech in situations where that may not be appropriate. Additionally, it puts them at risk of developing an unhelpful narrative, and the disorder can be unintentionally used as an excuse. Now, imagine communicating that to a patient. I mean, the, this is where it gets into the, these terms victim blaming and medical gaslighting, which is some, a, a term that I'm hearing revolving around cognitive behavioral therapy right now, which is unfortunate, because it can be easy to to make it seem like the patient in this, in this case is 
not being responsible enough or just like not being emotionally aware. Like there's a whole section of rational emotive behavioral therapy that gets into emotional resilience and emotional uh, granularity and awareness. And all of that is like revolving around dodging the issue of you not being in touch with your emotions enough and not being able to keep your crap together or whatever <laughs> is, is what that can sound like. And there is some truth to that, which is which is unfortunate. And, and because there's truth that we're avoiding talking about that in psychiatry and psych- psychology uh, in the clinic. But like it's hard for the psychologist just to say, you're going to have to suck it up a little bit there, little Jimmy. <laughs> it's, it's like there's no progress that comes without uncomfortable experiences or without some uncomfortable amount of effort and introspection. And when you're told that, like even if you're communicated that properly, like the way I just did, and you're offered a pill, the patient is going to see the pill. And even if instructed to use, to be aware of while they're using that pill, it's just something as a tool to help them improve themselves naturally, even then the patient is still going to be tempted to use that pill as the escape. Primar- the pill rep- primarily represents an option B, which inherently involves not working on the self and often involves escapism, and often implies and encourages escapism, and just like alcohol and other legal substances. And that's unfortunate because we love to combine those with video games, which also deeply encourages escapism. And uh, it's I've come to realize this, learn this the hard way, like smoking weed for over a decade and trying to work on myself over the last five years, like that's, it doesn't combine. Like you can't mix drugs with progress. Like that doesn't give you the open-minded clarity that allows you to have introspection and allows you to see yourself in the widest picture possible. You certainly can while under those substances, but it is much, much easier to do so while sober. Back to the spoons example. I only have so many spoons to give throughout the day. When we use the spoons metaphor in dep- talking about depression and anxiety, it's thought that it's a useful tool, but it can be counterproductive as well. It can be counterintuitive. So we have, I'm allowed to consider how many spoons I have. I'm allowed to, like, this is all up to me as to how many spoons I feel like I have. And that's totally based on feelings and feelings can be deceiving. We have to check our feelings at the door every time that we feel them. We have to ask them or ask ourselves, like, what are we feeling this for? What is the message here? And then we have to think rationally with it. Uh, this is what REBT, right? We have to think rationally, uh, emotively, or about our emotions. So, yes, let's talk about spoon theory just for a little bit here. It says that the spoon theory posits that individuals start each day with a certain amount of energy or number of spoons, the daily tasks and activities deplete. You might imagine those living with chronic conditions have fewer spoons than those of their neurotypical counterparts. So, we're using the term neurotypical again, and counterparts as if that is counter to uh, neuro- neurodivergent or neurospicy. And this I've had presented to me with Crohn's disease or the groups that I'm in for my Crohn's disease as well as my ADHD. So, let me very, very specific. The spoon theory runs absolutely counter to the second and third and fourth wind theories or the the idea that we have energy that we can give ourselves that we can give ourselves motivation we can motivate ourselves and put ourselves in a different state uh, writers know this writer those working with writer's block know that we can sit down and we're, we're trying to like finish an essay or a book we really 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 don't feel like doing it and the words are not coming to us and there's nothing that's clicking and after about 10 to 15 minutes sometimes even 30 minutes we get into that state so we can bring ourselves to those states when it comes to the idea of second wind with chronic illness pain that is another very uh, counterintuitive very co- possibly counterproductive psychology to be adopting is that you only have so much pain that you can deal with throughout the day i mean this runs back all 5000 years ago to buddhists trying to emphasize the embracing of suffering in life and how uh, dukkha is a major part of life and atma pratarana is our self deception away from that or our deceiving ourselves when we try to avoid suffering of all kinds and we try to block that out and try to uh, think that we we are separate from that and that we should be separate from it suffering is the ticket to life it is a transactional ticket that is more expensive for some than others let's say for me it's been extremely painful but i've had to come to uh, terms with it, I've had to come to uh, developing a personal psychology, and this is this is how it is for every every patient. Every patient is different. They're going to have to come up with their own personal psychology, and that message should be emphasized in the clinic as well, I believe, for dealing with their pain and suffering and dealing with their uh, their ADHD. So it's now that I only have so much energy and focus available for the day, and then I'm done for the rest of the day. That's not the mindset to get into. You want to be encouraging yourself to step away for a bit, take a refresher, do some breathing exercises, 
do some yoga nidra, some of the neurobiological tools that we have in our toolkit that Andrew Huberman talks about in his channel. Bring those into play. Bring those into the way that you handle your disease, your disorder and your disease. Don't tell yourself that you only have a limited amount of energy. Daily tasks and activities deplete a certain amount of energy we have. Yes, there is truth in that, but we can also restore our energy. It's about cultivating motivation. Like we're trying to instill a sense of motivating states to tell us to be drawn towards the kinds of activities that we know that we really want to be doing, like pursuing our skills, working on our talents, and not distracting ourselves from things that feel good in the moment. The language that we use surrounds that, so we can find excuses, and I don't like using that term, but I struggle to find another one. Like, these terms can be used as excuses to justify ourselves for having binge-watched binge in Netflix for like three hours straight, or uh, playing playing a game where it's a role-playing game where we're escaping to another role and uh, another living another life for X amount of time. And again, I get I get into this deeper in, in the book and the essays and other projects that I do online. You can go into that path and if you want to dedicate yourself, uh, dedicate your life to indulging in the arts and the end results of other, other people's goals having been met, uh, you can do that. Just do so mindfully and be able to appreciate it that much more. But uh, I digress. The issue is the adoption of these labels unconsciously and, and us wielding those labels and unconsciously using them to solidify and bolster our ego. And uh, it's unfortunate that we we seem to do this until we are made aware that we are doing this. Like It seems like that is a biological imperative that, that we're all kind of set up with. A neurobiological imperative that we really, really are subservient to that we need to be communicating. Like, I don't see why we can't talk about this in the education system. Anyways. So we adopt the flow state, or our natural draw to the, towards the flow state is felt much more in video games and in, in relatable situations where we're watching a storyline that we can relate to versus creating our own story or versus working on a project that takes us longer to get to the end result and see the impact that it has. And we are tempted to flow into using these uh, metaphors or using these very relatable branching terminologies like these labels and, and diagnoses to explain situations in lieu of deeply considering what's going on, deeply considering the symptomology and the, the patterns that you've been engaging in. But even putting it that way implies agency. Engaging in implies that you're doing this consciously. Um, the patterns that you've been picking up or the patterns that you're noticing your conscious organism is performing. And this is why I think it's a little beneficial to look at it through a, a determinist perspective or through a processing system uh, kind of perspective at times because it weighs easier on your shoulders. Like You don't want to be embodying complete ownership of everything that you've been all the mistakes that you've been making with your disorders. Just acknowledge that because that disorder is not reflective of your best self is what I mean. You want to perceive yourself as working towards your best self and to do that we always need to be in this ever onward and upward mindset. We always need to be questioning ourselves and looking at the patterns that we're that we're noticing or looking at the behavioral patterns and thought patterns that we see picking, that, that are coming up and get worse and get better and take note of when they get better and why they get better and that can be tricky to do when you're so very beholden to the thing uh, and that's unfortunate like if you have ADHD 10% of the US population has ADHD and that's those that are diagnosed with it and what we really see is that it seems to fall on a spectrum like we see symptoms of ADHD and those without or those that are deemed neurotypical are not within the range of neurodivergent or neurospicy and that uh, that is one way of looking at the situation is what I'm getting at it helps to use this broader spectrum language so that we don't categorize as best we can. So this is largely drawing on the physicalist causal model, suggesting that uh, we should look back at the patient's past. The psychology kind of hints at this necessarily in its doctrine. It says that we should step back, look at look at the patient's past step by step, like through their childhood psychology and their development, to bring them, them to where they are today. Well, this combines with neuroscience, and this is where we get neuropsychology. We can track back step by step the neuron chain cascades that led to the person saying and the thing that they said or doing what they did. So ideally, we want to be able to look at the human brain and the, the processing system that we have going on here as one that can repair itself, but it takes training to do that, and that training requires effort. That comes with the phenomenological uh, human experience, the embodied experience as we talk about it in 4 cognitive science, the mind and the body. Like, the, the brain, whenever it has its experiences, is felt by the body, and we have to bear that as we 
try to reset ourselves back. There are many psychological and personal life narrative problems that are involved in this, and uh, people's ability to to use uh, think in full sentences is also something that's on a very wide spectrum. But the problem I'm getting at is that we need to communicate this issue to patients somehow, uh, that they are so very beholden to the the sponginess and the neuroplasticity of their own brains. Uh, we need to communicate this without upsetting them somehow. Uh, we need to put this into common language. And I can see where psychology has tried to do that, and obviously, like, psychology is not ignorant of what I'm talking about, but it's resulting in us kind of, like, turning a blind eye to certain things and being a little bit too soft with our, with the way that we talk about things, as well as the diagnostic terminology that we use. So we have to communicate to patients that it is going to take some amount of uncomfortable work to either transcend their current self or return back to the self, the self that they wanted to be. And we also have this issue of encouraging the patients to deeply introspect and to deeply examine their sensitivities and to uh, examine their emotions while also encouraging them to be resilient and not be overwhelmed by their emotions and to have some form of parasympathetic uh, stress acclimation that's been developed over time. This is where we have the cold showers and the exposure to the traumatic events to get over or to address uh, ther <coughs> therapeutically address psychologically damaging traumas and traumatic events or, and exposure therapy. Mm -hmm.